listen to me and to listen to, to hear about this work that I've been involved in for the last uh, 10 years, that's it. Yeah. It's the body of work. And so, uh, um, but yeah, this is a topic that's very close to, to my own heart. Uh, it's a topic I feel very strongly about, and it's a topic that I feel I'm, we're continuously learning about. Um, it's very current, it's very relevant. <coughs> Um, given the whole policy drivers towards involvement and engagement and participation that currently characterise uh, the health and social care context. So this is very relevant not only for social work but also for anybody going into the health professions. And I know there are a number of students here today who, who hopefully this will find this interesting as well as others. Um, <laughs> the body of work I've researched since 2006, the, the main conclusion that I've reached is that if social workers can approach helping relationships in a way that are truly engaging, with the lived in reality and experiential position of the user perspective, using principles of humanity, trust and respect, they are more likely to achieve better informed and partnership based working relationships. That's the conclusion of my work since I started this way back in 2003. So that notion of trying to affect partnership working relationships based on principles of humanity um, and respect can in the longer term achieve better outcomes in terms of your working relationships with service users. The whole topic of service user involvement is a political one. Um, it's a political question. Uh, service user involvement is concerned with issues of citizenship, democracy, and social justice. So it's much that word involvement is imbued with other more deep-seated meanings in terms of democracy, social justice, and citizenship. And hopefully those themes will come to life and in my subsequent presentation. I would also make the point that without service user involvement, social work would be a very controlling rather than a liberating activity. Um, so, but there are a number, I mean the title of my presentation today is called Drinking from the Well, and you're probably wondering what on earth has that got to do with anything, where does that come from? Um, developing social work practice with service users and carers. So, just before I get to the well, I just want to say a bit about myself and, um, and one of the things that I had to think about, and thanks so much Brenda for that, those, the, for the lovely introduction, um, but whenever I was doing my PhD, my supervisor did encourage me to think about why I felt this topic was important to me as a researcher, as a person, and it made me sort of go back to, to when I was 15, to when I was helping my father who was trying to recover from a stroke at that stage and, and at 15 I didn't really know what career I wanted to follow um, like anybody at that age um, football was coming to mind, music, stuff like that um, but my dad getting a stroke um, going to the day centre with him on a bus just watching the way he was treated the way he felt included and the way he felt valued I mean, I still remember that, and he didn't feel as if he was labelled in any way, or if he was made to feel different in any way. And I really noticed those sort of qualities that the day centre manager naturally conveyed towards my dad at that stage. Uh, sort of that sense of humanity, him being treated really as a very important person, as an individual. And that, I think that stuck, stuck with me. Um, and that was the experience I brought with me into my own selection for social work. Um, and I still remember my, my, my own interview when I was 18, going into study social work, and that's what I talked about then. Um, what I learned from actually looking after my dad as a young carer. Um, and when I graduated in, at the age of 22, I mean, I mean, the majority of my experience has been in family and child care as a family and child care social worker and then laterally as a senior social worker in family and child care 
And as a social worker, I was always acutely aware of the sort of power that I had over the lives of, of service users and how much power you actually wield in, in, a, in a statutory family and child care social work setting. Um, I worked in that context for quite a while and then did my practice teaching course um, and worked in various further and higher education colleges in Northern Ireland before I got my first job in the University of Ulster in a higher education setting, the university setting, in 2003. And that was a really interesting year for social work education in Northern Ireland uh, because the framework, the new degree in social work was being introduced and it was introduced in 2004. So starting off in social work at that time of significant and monumental change was really a really interesting time to come into the profession. And one of the things that was talked about at that stage, um, and a colleague in the back row there who will remember this as well, John McLaughlin, um, was the involvement of service users and carers in the social work degree. Uh, and it sort of made me think about how that was going to be approached in a way that would uh, try to achieve service user and carer involvement that would be real, genuine, and most importantly, non-tokenistic. Um, and that really marked the beginning of my thinking about developing research in this particular field. Um, and I published Good Practice Guidance in 2006 about how service user and care involvement should be meaningfully approached in the social work curriculum in Northern Ireland. One of the other important things that was introduced into the social work curriculum in 2004 was that people who were directly affected by the troubles in Northern Ireland should also have a say uh, that students should also be taught about what was called in the curriculum the Northern Ireland context. So I made a recommendation in that first piece of work that service users who have experience of the troubles also should be involved in teaching students and sharing their experience, their experiential knowledge <coughs> based on their experience of trauma and being bereaved and being affected by the troubles. So I suppose that was an, in an innovative departure that I felt could also approach service user involvement in a meaningful and non-tokenistic and genuine way. Um, and in those very early days, I didn't really know how to approach um, researching this topic, but Northern Ireland's a small place, so you find out from people who know other people who say to you, why don't you talk to such and such a person? They're really good, they have a lot of experience. So um, at that stage, I, I met uh, Jeremy Harbison, Dr. Jeremy Harbison, who was chair then of the Northern Ireland Social Care Council. And Jeremy said to me, Joe, why don't you talk to a guy called Brendan McKeever, who, who lives in Derry. Uh, Brendan did a lot of work and a lot of campaigning for the Family Information Group uh, to, to support the parents of children living with disabilities. And, uh, I met Brendan, and Brendan said to me, look Joe, if you're serious about this, if you're serious about this topic, this just can't be something for you as an academic to be doing as a piece of research. This has to be real, because service user involvement is real for so many people. It's a way of life. It's part of the way we live our lives every day. Um, and he said, it's a bit like a well. And he said, most people just go to the well to get a drink of water. But if you're serious about this, you have to go to the well and get into it. And let that well swallow you up and drink you dry. And then go out again and try and demonstrate your understanding of this topic. But you'll have to keep going back to that well. So that sort of metaphor stayed with me. Right through to last year when I submitted my PhD for examination. Uh, and Brendan actually read my PhD as well. I let him read it from cover to cover um, to make sure that what I was saying was accurate and that it was truly user-based and user-centered. Uh, he also read my presentation for today. So it's a relationship that has continued and one that I have learned immensely from uh, since I first met Brendan way back in 2003. So that gives you a bit of background in terms of the sort of cumulative, those, those are the four key influences that have shaped the fact that I can now stand here and talk to you about this topic and I'm still learning about it. And I find it really interesting um, and I could talk for a long time about it but I won't do that because I don't want to, don't want to bore you too much. 
The presentation today as well is going to end with a video that I made with the colleagues from Slovenia and Spain where we looked at service user involvement across three countries. So I'll let you hear what service users and carers from three different countries are saying about how they want to be treated by social workers. And it's refreshing in terms of hearing that the key messages are the same. Uh, so there is a universality, an international aspect to how people actually want to be treated. There's, there's a connecting theme. And that connecting theme is that really important word, humanity. Okay? So we'll come to that in a wee minute. I've made this room very dark, so as you can see, is that all right? Because mm -hmm. when the lines were up, it was too bright. <coughs> you with me so far, everyone? Mm -hmm. So there's a wee picture of the whale. Okay. Um, you don't see too many whales like that around you. Mm -hmm. But uh, so drinking from the whale is the metaphor I, I'm using in the presentation to portray just how challenging and how how much is involved in trying to achieve involvement that is real, meaningful, um, and non-tokenistic. I very much owe that to, to Brendan McKee for that, that particular concept. Um, you need a pair of binoculars to see the next slide. Um, but that's just to give you an idea of what this work is based on. So, those are all the publications that I have commenced and that have formed the basis of, of this particular work and my doctoral uh, studies. Uh, there's over 20 of them there, and they're all connected in and around the theme of service user involvement. Um, so I think this presentation is available for mm -hmm. downloading off the website, so you can have a closer look at some of those. I just want to highlight the, the two key documents that have formed a very significant part of the, the approach that I take and the conclusion that I made at the very beginning about the importance of affecting partnership outcomes with service users based on approaches to practice that are based on uh, humanity and respect. The first document here is called Participating in Learning Citizen Involvement in Social Work Education in the Northern Ireland Context. Now, there are important words in there. So, participating and learning. But also the word citizen. Why do you think the word citizen might be important? Why do you think you used that word way back then? Any ideas on that? When you hear the word citizen, what sort of thoughts come to mind? Just anybody in society. So there's something about equality. It could be anybody. Yeah. So I intentionally chose the word citizen because of I wanted to try and indicate that there was a, a sort of universality around service user and carer because I did get a sense that there was a division that there was something around the language that was contested. Um, the word service user in itself isn't a word, isn't a term that's popular with people who are service users because of its description of people only in relation to the service that they receive, as opposed to looking at people in a more sort of rounded way, as a mother, as a friend, as a musician, as an artist. You know that this, this term service user is only being used to define somebody in the relationship that they have to a service that's been provided. And exactly the same thing can be said for carer. So that was my very early attempt to try and level out the whole language theme. Now that's not to say that citizen, the word citizen itself, isn't contested because some people who are in receipt of services don't regard themselves as having full citizenship because of their experiences of oppression, exclusion and marginalisation. But that was my very first attempt and I designed this myself as well in terms of trying to portray this sense of that we're all in this together. Um, my next important publication in terms of this work was Looking Out from the Middle and that was published in 2008. And again, it shows the title there very carefully, looking out from the middle. 
And that concept of being in the middle was influenced by a service user who said, in response to the question that I asked about, how do you want to be treated in terms of your experience of, of health and social care? And she said, I want to be in the middle looking out. So I thought, right, that's, that's something that I need to reflect in the work that I'm going to be publishing on that. So those are key documents in regard to shaping the, the type of uh, approach that I'm advocating based, based on my research and based on my work. So again, it's not very easy to see that from down there, but those, those are the key res research projects that I've developed <coughs> subsequent to looking out from the middle and the good practice guide that I published in 2006. So, Service user involvement in teaching about conflict and exploration of the issues. So this was a publication in 2012 looking at the issues that need to be addressed in regard to involving people that have been affected by the conflict. Uh, some of the opportunities that there are in relation to involving people that have been on the receiving end of, uh, of very difficult situations in their lives. Um, there are also two other publications here in regard to the involvement of service users in teaching social work students in their own settings, in their own communities, where social work students go out after their teaching on social work values to try and determine the meaning of those values by asking service users in their own communities to try and enable them to make links between theory and practice. And the final uh, DVD that I just published there last year is looking at service user and care involvement across three countries uh, Northern Ireland, Spain and Slovenia. <coughs> the connecting themes that emerge through all of the work I've done are around power, language, humanity, relationship, knowledge, tokenism and innovation. Okay, so the word power in particular is something that appears throughout all of my work. And Smith in 2008, Roger Smith defines power as the nature of power and how it is exercised lies very much at the heart of the relationship between social workers and service users. So the word power is very much a dominant feature characterizing my work with service users in research, policy, and education. Power very clearly evidences and manifests itself in language and the language that we use to describe people who are on the receiving end of our service. Because how we name something in many ways can determine how we, how we behave towards that particular person who's on the receiving end of our particular service. The notion of humanity is articulated in nearly all of my work. That notion of relationship, respect, truly listening, truly making the attempt to go the extra mile and being truly engaging in terms of how we approach our relationships with service users. The notion of knowledge comes across very strongly in all, in all of the work I've done. The recognition that experiential knowledge can subtly influence and guide our actions in regard to policy, research and education. And the work that I've done very clearly indicates that user knowledge grows from personal experience of policy, practice and services. And I've put forward this notion of situated knowledge and that comes from the actual experience that you have of being on the receiving end of a particular service. But nonetheless knowledge is contested because there is in the, the literature would, would refer to this notion of a hierarchy of knowledge and the fact that knowledge that comes from more objective and neutral terms is regarded as having more weight and more clout and more impact than knowledge that's more <coughs> subjectively based or experientially based. So that, that's a tension that needs to be recognised and worked with in regard to recognising the value of service user knowledge itself. The word tokenism is something that needs to be looked at very carefully because tokenism can occur where service user involvement is invited in order to in some ways evidence that the service user has been listened to 
Now that in itself is really important, the fact that you're attempting to engage in that way. But nonetheless, service users in the work that I have done are very wary about just being called in or just being invited in to actually evidence that their view or their opinions on a particular issue has been sought. Non-tokenistic engagement means that service users are actually in right from the very beginning and are aware and are fully engaged throughout the particular area that, for which their involvement has been sought. The other issue that I've tried to approach is, is being innovative in terms of approaching this notion of service user involvement. Whenever this was introduced into the degree in 2004, there was a sense that this was going to involve service users coming into college all the time, coming into the university setting. Um, however, I was, I was quite keen, along with others at the time, to look at ways in which we could move the involvement experience from the university out into the community. And that's why we pioneered that, top, that subject of, of involving students going out with their theory to actually try and determine how theory, theory related to practice in community settings. So, the way in which I did my work over the 10 years or so, it basically involved collaborating very closely with service users and carers and how I designed my research. Um, so, this involved academics and service users working together in designing questionnaires, in designing surveys, in designing interviews and actually doing the data collection together. A lot of the projects involved evaluation uh, with baseline and then pre-test and post-test. So as we were able to determine whether there had been a change, whether there had been a difference. So, and that we, I knew from research that um, there was a gap in the literature about impact studies in relation to service user involvement. So I felt it was really important to demonstrate that service users were making a concrete difference to how students learn and the quality of their learning in particular. Um, in all the projects that I've been involved in, there was a total of 723 people. So that's quite a significant <coughs> number of respondents over, over about 10 years' work. Um, so. What really guided me in terms of approaching the partnership working in terms of research was this notion of an ethic of care. And that's where we worked very closely as researchers to look at what our experiences were, what our strengths were, um, and to look after each other as well in the research process because research is very difficult, it's very challenging. Um, so the ethic of care concept was a very good way of, of helping to guide us all collectively through the sort of research endeavour that we were involved in. So what sort of contribution has my, made, has my work made? Um, so significantly we now routinely involve people affected by the troubles in teaching in Queen's. Um, as a result of that initiative, um, other parts of the world have been affected by conflict uh, such as Israel, are also considering adopting this particular approach. And it's also been considered in other parts of the world that are emerging from, uh, from difficult, uh, contested situations. The Looking Out from the Middle research in 2008 was introduced at a really important time in policy in Northern Ireland. In 2007, the notion of personal and public involvement was introduced to policy in Northern Ireland. Our research was published one year later, and it recommended the systematic involvement at an operational and strategic level of service users and carers in key aspects of health and social care in Northern Ireland. So it came out at a very significant time, and a year later it became a statutory requirement to evidence PPI in terms of how how we work with the users of our health and social care service. <coughs> Currently in Northern Ireland as well, we involve service users in the assessment of students who are about to go out in their first practice learning um, placement. So we now routinely have service users formally assessing our students in the preparation for practice module that they take at Queen's, and also I understand that's, that's happening in the University of Ulster as well. 
So that's a really important development in terms of valuing the role that service users and carers can make to the assessment of, of students' preparedness for practice. Um, we also involve service users in what the literature refers to as communities of learning. So this is where we send our students out after their teaching to actually enable them to see, well, what does the theory that we've just learned about in the university mean to service users in practice? So, and that's the approach that I used in the DVD as well, with Spain and Slovenia. So one of the questions is, whenever you have a social worker, how do you want to be treated? Okay, so th that's an example of a question that the students actually bring out to service user and care communities in Northern Ireland after their, their introductory teaching on social <coughs> values. So it's a really important way for the students to make connections between what we teach them and what that feels like, what it means in practice for service users. Um, so the opportunities that this has provided, I suppose, is that, I mean, we, we have benefited in terms of the research that we've done from the insights that we've had from service users about research design. So whenever we, I mean, a lot of the work that I did involved questionnaires, involved interviews. So the questions have actually been co-designed by service users and academics working together. So it has really enriched the quality of our data on an epistemological level. Uh, quite a hard word to say that one. Mm -hmm. um, so it has really enriched the, the, the quality of the data that we've gathered because we've been able to access experiential knowledge which complements academic and researcher knowledge. We feel that we've been able to access richer data as a result of that and as a result of involving service users themselves as researchers they have been able to advance their own capabilities and capacities. I mean one of the service users who's worked with me on a couple of studies over the years is now doing a master's in research methods herself uh, and she is somebody who, ha who has a disability, has had a disability from birth and she's now, after she finishes her master's, she hopes to go on to do a PhD herself. So this isn't just something that has helped the, the quality of our research, this is something that's actually advanced the capabilities and potential of other people other service users and other really important aspects of their lives. Um, and we feel that the involvement of service users and carers has really deepened the sort of quality of learning that our students have been able to evidence throughout, throughout their studies with us uh, on the social work course. Nonetheless, this is not plain sailing and there are some difficulties and, and I've Describe this here as, as contradictions. Um, I mean, user involvement appeals to both the political left and the right, and these sort of different ideological standpoints. The political left feel that service user, import, service user involvement is important because it can evidence empowerment, empowerment of people who are socially excluded and marginalized. For the political right, it can also evidence consumerism, choice, and having an influence. So you can see it's, it sort of sits at the axis at the crossroads between managerialism and democracy. So therefore it's favoured by both uh, spectrums along that sort of ideological slant between the left and the right. Surely service user knowledge is just too subjective. It's just based on some of these one individual experience, so therefore how can it deliver an objective truth? Surely this doesn't hold the same level of intellectual clout or intellectual weight as other more traditional forms of positivistic knowledge, more scientific knowledge. So service user knowledge actually is right at the, at the heart of that sort of epistemological debate in terms of its value, its credibility, its weight. Um, Accepting that service users have something to say can also be a direct challenge to 
the professional's power base, the fact that professionals feel that their knowledge in terms of their professional training is insufficient to the extent that they now feel that they need to be listening to experiential knowledge potentially could be viewed as being a threat. The other point that Smith makes in 2008 is that service users may feel so disenfranchised from any reality of citizenship that the operation of power may therefore be seen as very one way, very much one way. So this notion of consultation fatigue is something that we need to be very aware of. The fact that people may be feeling that, look, it's not going to make a difference anyway, what's the point in being involved if we, if, you know, the, the problems are just so intractable. Another point that comes out of the literature by Kerry in 2009 is that is it even morally questionable for service users to be participating with a political and economic system that's responsible for causing so many of the problems? So that's a moral question even around this whole particular concept of involvement. Why should somebody be involved with a system that's actually been responsible for putting them in the position that they're in? So these are sort of conceptual ambiguities that we need to wrestle with in terms of approaching this topic in a meaningful and non-tokenistic way. So I'm just coming towards the latter few slides now. Uh, and this particular slide evidences what we already know from the literature in terms of partnership working, engagement and involvement. Okay. So I'll just read these out to you. Being open and honest are critical attributes for social workers in helping service users to accept and process difficult, difficult decisions. And that's a paper in the British Journal of Social Work that was written by Mark Smith, senior lecturer at Glasgow University, and a number of his colleagues. Um, it's a wide-ranging study, and that's their key conclusion, that difficult decisions will be easier to process and access for people if they feel there's been a sense of social justice and honesty and trust in terms of how that has been communicated. Another piece of research that was undertaken by Helen Buckley, a professor in the south of Ireland in, the, in Trinity. Service user negativity is neutralised by a quality relationship between social workers and families. So service user negativity, as she refers to it as being neutralised when there's a sense of quality in that particular relationship. There's a host of other studies that, that, that have been undertaken that will allude to the fact and very clearly conclude that positive outcomes attached to social work practice, which is positive, partnership and strengths based. Okay? Equally, a colleague in, in Kansas University, uh, Jerry DeMann, makes the point that ineffective engagement approaches are unlikely to achieve positive outcomes for parents and their children. And again, that aligns with the argument that has been made by Mark Smith earlier and the, and the other authors as well. So that's what we already know from the evidence in regard to this particular topic. The conclusions that I'm making are as follows. <coughs> If user involvement is approached in a structured and genuine way, positive outcomes again will result in terms of developing practice with service users and carers that is relationship and partnership based. <coughs> this approach to practice is consistently valued and called for by those in receipt of our service. I found that say there were 723 people involved in all of the studies that, was, that, that, that I worked on over the years and that theme emerges right throughout that particular body of work. The exercise of power is legitimized in the social work role when the professional relationship is built on trust and respect. People can accept harsh and difficult decisions that social workers inevitably are going to have to confront if they feel there's been a sense of openness, honesty, humanity, relationship, respect and trust evidence in how that has been communicated. Service users and carers in Northern Ireland and beyond have an important role to play at all levels of social work education and knowledge production, particularly in critical pedagogy, dealing with threshold concepts and, and in helping students link theory to practice. 
What I mean there by critical pedagogy is the type of teaching that's really challenging that involves addressing controversial, sensitive, very, very difficult, hard to teach topics. Okay? Service users and carers can actually meaningfully assist us in approaching those particular topics. Threshold concepts are concepts that are difficult to learn, difficult to process, but once you've been able to get your head around them, are transformational to learning. That notion of threshold concepts. And you will, you will encounter threshold concepts in social work and also in other caring professions such as nursing. So I refer to a threshold concept there, for example, as understanding the impact of the troubles. Understanding what social work values actually mean in practice. Um, service users and carers also have a key role to play in the management and delivery of health and social care. Their knowledge is something that has to be tapped into. It has to be accessed, but it has to be accessed in a meaningful, genuine, and, and, uh, and, and in a way that's based on trust. Service user involvement, nonetheless, has to, has to be approached in an empowering and critical way. Just because somebody uses their knowledge based on a user perspective doesn't necessarily mean that it's always right, or doesn't necessarily mean that it is right. There, also, there could be another way of looking at the particular issue. So it's a, it's a more insidious form of tokenism if we unquestionably accept the user perspective without interrogating it to a sense of interactional interrogation which, which Shorthall argues in, in 2012. Thereby you're subjecting that knowledge to a critical lens and in a critical way. Social workers should not lose sight of the justice and politically orientated aspects of their role. It's really refreshing at the moment that a number of our students are setting up a social work action network here in Northern Ireland to advocate for that sense of social work being political and really being rooted in social justice in terms of how we intervene with people who have been affected by oppression and marginalisation in their lives. And that's something that social workers <coughs> need to rediscover and that is also recognised in the literature. Approaches to involvement should be underpinned by the values of the social work profession. In other words, we should be approaching user involvement based on choice, ownership, control and citizenship. And there should be opportunities for growth and capacity building built in for everybody involved. Not just that we produce a good piece of work, but that the people that have been involved as co-producers of that work also get a sense that they're getting something out of it. And the final point is extremely important and it's something that I've found it takes a long time to build up trusting relationships. These relationships are, are also, could also be broken quite easily if there's an absence of those particular values that I've just alluded to in the previous point. Relationship building takes time, investment and hard work. So in terms of where I'm going to try and go next with my work, um, there is a gap in terms of how service user involvement has been theorised. And if it's under theorised, there's also potentially a problem that this particular field of work or area of studies will not be taken seriously. So therefore, one of the contributions I am trying to lead on at the moment in working with Peter Beresford and other leading academics in the field is to look at, social, is to look at user involvement through a more critical lens and through the lens of social theory, using drawing on the work of modern social theorists such as Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Michel Foucault, and Axel Honneth. So th those are particular papers that I'm currently working on with colleagues here in Northern Ireland and beyond. We're also coming towards the end of a study with colleagues from the University of Birmingham, where we're assessing the longer term impact of service user involvement in social work education on the practice of newly qualified social workers. We're at the stage at the moment of having that study almost written up and hopefully it will be published very soon. So, and this is the first study of its kind in the UK. Um, and I mean, this notion of service user involvement in social work education, Northern Ireland, the, the UK, is the only part of the world where this happens in such a structured and systematic way has been happening in other pockets of practice in other parts of the world, but not in the systematic, structured way in which we have stitched into the curriculum. 
but there's currently a gap in terms of the literature as to determine whether does this make a difference on how people practice when they qualify and currently we have evidence in relation to that where we've been following the practice of newly qualified social workers in both Birmingham and in Queen's University. So I'll be making that research available pretty soon. Um, one of the area, other areas that I'm currently developing or looking at as an idea is the involvement of service users in the community in mentoring other service users who are in the receipt of, I suppose, sharper edge services like, like child protection. And at the moment, this particular idea is, is at seed stage. But conceptually, what I'm trying to put forward is that we will have service users in the community who will work alongside other service users who maybe have social workers and family and child care for the first time. And these are maybe people who've come through the system, who've worked through the system, and who will be able to impart their knowledge, their experiential knowledge, trying to help other service users to understand the challenges and difficulties that they're facing in their lives. Um, so the idea is that I would work along with a number of service users in a, in a trust area uh, and develop this as a pilot project. Um, so hopefully as well you'll be hearing a bit, a bit more about that soon. Um, I'm also very keen to look at ways in which we can meaningfully involve service users in the assessment of practice learning where we could, for example, have service users working alongside practice teachers when students are out on placement to help them with, with supervising students. And it would be, be a natural development from the experience that the students have in the university where they see service users coming in and they have a very important elevated role in other aspects of their teaching. So that's another thing that I'm trying to work on and develop at the moment. Uh, working with my colleague here at the front, Brenda, we're also trying to look at ways in which we could develop a mobile app that the newly qualified social workers could use in their assessed year of employment to reconnect them back with the importance of the messages that they've had around service user involvement. So again, that's at its very early stages, but uh, we're hoping to do some further work on that. Um, and the other one is to try and encourage students on placement to have observational practice opportunities where they can maybe spend a morning with a carer or with a service user to get a sense or a day or a period of their practice where they can actually observe what it's like to be a carer or what it's like to be a service user attending a daycare setting or you know going to a case conference or actually being in receipt of a particular service. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to again that notion of innovation, trying to think differently about the particular topic but also to involve this notion of more harder to reach um, messages. So, as you can see, I'm going to be fairly busy moving ahead. These are some of the people, you probably can't see that very clearly as well as I can see it on the screen, but these are a number of the people that have been highly influential in my thinking and enabling me to get this done and successfully completed. I wouldn't have been able to do this without a number of the people that you see in that photograph. Um, but as I say, it takes hard work, it takes time, and it takes investment in the relationship. Um, I'm going to let you see a clip of the DVD, if that's okay, if we have time, mm -hmm. yeah. um, before we move on to questions. And just to give you a final thought, um, and this is what Brendan said to me the other night, whenever I sent him my presentation, he wrote back saying, can you please say just a bit more about the whale, Joe? Uh, and can you say that the whale can swallow you up? and that this is more than an academic topic. It's not just a subject, it's a way of life. It's real. And believe me, when I, sometimes when I'm really tired and, and struggling with how I'm approaching the topic and understanding it, I'll write to Brendan and say, Brendan, I'm in the whale, can you help me? Um, and we, we do have that sort of relationship where he can, I, I do find that his view on stuff is, is quite nourishing because it's a way of life for Brendan. Um, I'm trying to get to the point as well where I can, you know, spend longer periods in the whale, but uh, it is a way of life, it's a way of thinking, and when you're engaged in this deep way of thinking, it's very, very challenging. It's not just something that you can think, well, that's a good idea, let's have user involvement in this, or let's have user involvement in that. To do this and to do it well, well, 
it means you have to get into that world. I hope I've reflected that the way Brendan will want me to. Um, have you any comments you want to make just now before I change direction or anything you want to ask me before I let you see just a bit of the, the film? I was just wondering, if you look back to those, and I'm sure you have, um, the two documents looking out from the middle and um, participating in learning yeah. um, that you completed back in 2008 or whatever, is there any kind of appendix you would do to them now, given the work that you've done subsequent to that, or do you feel that those kind of messages within those reports are still fairly current? Well, I do feel that they're still fairly current, but I, I, it probably would be good to revisit them. Uh, the 2006 publication is now coming up to its to its uh, 10th anniversary. I think social work has changed. I think the nature and complexion of social work has changed. You know, post Monroe, post uh, Victoria Columbia, I think we are now living and practicing and working in quite a proceduralized, highly regulated, you know, quite a managerial social work context. So I do feel, you know, trying to find a place for service user involvement within the sort of managerial complexion of social work practice is itself quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that could be revisited in relation to both documents. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think towards the end there you, you, you've seen some of the um, ways forward or some of the new suggestions I have. I think we also have to take cognizance of the fact that we, we also live now in an increasingly mo digitally mobile mm -hmm. age. But uh, we also have to tap into the fact that uh, service user involvement also can, can be approached in a way that reflects the sort of innovation that's out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joe, can you ask about your definition of the service user and the carer? Yeah. And, you know, I'm coming from a foster care perspective. Yeah. Um, and just whether the carer sort of fleets between being a sort of service user as well and a service provider and mm -hmm. you know just how at times those I mean I, I find that very interesting to me but kind of wondered at times was I was viewing the service user as being the carer at times. Yeah. And it's just what you're thinking as well. I think that's increasingly I mean one of the first things that I wrote and that wasn't published and it was my very early attempts to try and write as an academic, uh, was this notion of citizenship, social work, as a theory, as a theoretical position. Um, and still like that notion of citizen being used as a way to describe both service user and carer. Because I do feel that there is a, there is a real inherent problem with using terms like that, that are in a way can narrowly perceive somebody only by one particular aspect of their life. So, but nonetheless, and paradoxically, service users and carers increasingly now are saying, well look, that's the literature, that's how people most readily identify with us and recognize us. So I have to be very careful about any sort of language that I'm putting forward uh, around the sensitivities that people have about um, how they're going to be referred and how they're going to be described because as I said earlier on, how you define and how you describe and how you refer to somebody will influence how you behave towards them. And equally the language that we use to describe somebody who's in the seat of the service is itself imbued with power. So it's reflective of a power relationship. So I'm not so sure if that's answering your question but I mean I've, I'm really struggling with the whole language stuff because there's user there's expert by ex expert by experience, um, survivor, client, customer, consumer. I mean, all of that literature is out there, not only here in Northern Ireland, but nationally in the UK and the South of Ireland as well, and internationally. But I still keep coming back to that word citizen. Mm -hmm. Now, that is fraught with complexity and ambiguity itself. I don't know what you think of it. Um, but I've been I've been a carer myself, and, and in some ways I did want to be I did want that I wanted that notion also to be recognised mm -hmm. in a strange way. 
but I didn't want it to totally typify how the person visiting or how the person in connection with us viewed the totality of our lives and our relationships. There's something in there for me about the, the volunteering aspect. You know, most service users don't choose to be a service user. They, by yeah. circumstances, they yeah. become a service user. Yeah. They're all service users if we've been to the, do the doctors recently, I suppose. But if it's um, in terms of the care or the goal that I'm thinking about, many have chosen to yeah. become. Carer. Yeah, in terms Other of fostering, for example. Like kinship foster carers, yeah. for example, it's circumstances that has drawn them into uh, maintaining a kind of a, and I suppose, stigma, and all of those things then come into how we perceive and yeah. behave towards, <coughs> as you say, those um, service users or mm. carers or. Yeah. No, and I think it, I mean, some aspects of the literature as well would, would, would use the notion of service refusers <laughs> to reflect that notion of, of being sort of catapulted into a situation that you've no control over and that you feel you have no power over and where you feel you don't have any exercise of citizenship. So it really is complex, the language, and I mean, I've presented as well to the NISC participation group about how on this particular, and I researched all the terms that were being used so as the participation group themselves could choose how they wanted to be known and how they wanted to be referred to. Um, but I mean, basically I start with the person who's on the receiving end in terms of how do you want to be referred, how do you want to be described. And interestingly, there is also in the literature, sometimes people express still a positive view of the word client As maybe feeling that that's less stigmatizing or less labeling. Sorry, Paul. So I, I, I think I think the term citizenship or citizen uh, helps neutralize the yeah. power relationship um, because I suppose in a, in a sense all services uh, to people living in society uh, is about deploying a need or a review or an assessment mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It's not about um, label, labeling people um, because they need a service or because they're in a particular situation. So I think, I, mean, I quite like the term citizen. You touched a wee bit on the research that you're on, you're currently doing around social work, in mm -hmm. particularly um, both here and in England. Yeah. It, are there any key messages that you want to share? I, mean, I don't want to preempt that obviously your publication, but in the context of what we're talking about today, are there any key messages that would be useful to Yeah, there are some particular individual, the students in both sites have referred to the fact that there are some individuals that have encountered through their training that have had a significant impact on their understanding of stigma. Um, and that is how some of those individuals involved have been able to portray particular message. So there is something about how the experiential knowledge is delivered. So is it in order for it to have a more enduring short term, medium term and longer term impact. We're also finding some of the students are finding difficulty with, with the challenges and pressures of practice. The sort of procedural and regulated nature, the very pressurized nature mm -hmm. of practice is a real challenge to some of the newly qualified students to have the time to focus on relationships. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that I'm talking about, humanity and relationship and trust, is, is going to find itself, is, is going to be difficult to actually find expression in practice if that practice is characterized by the intensity of the pressure that currently <coughs> exists. So that's a, that's a theme that's coming right across both settings is the challenge that's been currently presented by the complexion of practice. Um, a number of the, the students as well are saying that they feel that they need some sense of refresher input around the importance of these key messages. And that's something I think that we'll, we'll need to look at 
uh, in regard to the assessed year of employment. Um, and also in, in relation to how we stage the involvement of service users throughout the course. I mean, I think at the moment in both universities we probably have more of a preponderance of service user involvement at the beginning, and maybe a bit in the middle, but I think we maybe need to have more of a prevalent presence of service users and carers maybe towards the end, at level three before the students qualify. Now I would caveat that by saying that these conclusions haven't been agreed yet with my colleagues in Birmingham, but that seems to be the sort of thrust <coughs> that uh, there are some individuals that are definitely having an impact. The managerial nature of social work practice currently, and the sort of neo influence of neoliberalism, is really challenging students, newly qualified social workers, to get the time to do the sort of relationship-based work that we're, that basically is at the heart. Social work is fundamentally about working alongside other people. That's the most basic definition of what it is we do. So if you're not getting the time to do that, well then I think we're, we're up against a serious problem. Well, I was thinking when you were saying that earlier, you know, the challenges for social workers, newly qualified social workers, particularly in gateway teams where yeah. you know, the care control dimensions there, there's a quick turnaround, you know, how, how realistic is it to build a relationship within 10 working days when you're covering very fraud issues. Yeah. Um, but even the aspect of openness and honesty, you know, being there is very key, but it must be challenging for social workers to kind of live out meaningful involvement and relationship building in different contexts of provision. Absolutely, but fundamentally if they don't, their, their attempts at engagement and partnership working are going to be really made more challenging and more difficult. Mm -hmm. And yet partnership working is what lies at the heart, particularly in family and child care work, of the children order in terms of how we work. Uh, and it also is populated in other aspects of community care legislation and the fact that in Northern Ireland and in other parts of the UK we're expected to evidence personal and public involvement and patient and public involvement. So the policy context is very much driving everybody towards the, the importance of inclusion and engagement and involvement. And I think that's the real pressures and I mean my doctoral work reflects that as well. That, Yes, this, these, these are really important principles, but you know, the sharp end of family and child care work, other more statutory laden forms of social work, also pose real challenges to you know, enabling us to affect this and, sort of partnership. And I suppose our thinking around the development of that app is about equipping yeah. social workers with the tools you yeah. know, and the confidence to be able to, yeah. to live that out you know, amidst the challenges. Yeah. Yes. Georges, you were saying there about citizenship. I think a key one that was coming for me is um, participants. Yeah. Do you know, so you have the citizenship, but even participants, that could be the organisations, that could be other professionals, but also the person. Yeah. So is that, you know, for participants, everybody, within whether you're a social worker working with a family, sitting in the case conference, everybody's participating in that. Mm -hmm. But also going down the road, knowing a lot of um, newly qualified social workers coming out into teams, you know, is there something within your research that is going to reflect on the system that they're going into and the structure that you can only do so much within the educational system, within the university in preparing the social work students, but when they enter out into the world of work, the system that's there to support them and develop them on. Well, it's a very good point because um, the literature, I mean, uh, a colleague called Jerry Chu in 2006 wrote a really important paper called Power and Powerlessness in Social Work. And uh, one of his conclusions on the conclusion of Alan Davis as well, a, a retired academic from the University of Birmingham, very clearly says that organisations that are wedded and committed to participatory working practices, their employees will, will find it easier or less challenging to achieve partnership-based relationships themselves. So the culture of the organisation is absolutely critical. Um, now, at the moment we're doing some research for the Public Health Agency and for the Patient Planning Council um, um, in relation to personal and public involvement in Northern Ireland and evaluating that. So that may enable us to make some important conclusions as well about the nature of the working environment because all of the health and social care providers have duties around 
what we call PPI, personal and public involvement. So those organisations need to think very carefully about their approaches to participation, you know, at a structural level, in order to ensure that, as Brendan was saying on the final slide, this becomes a way of working and a way of thinking um, and a way of approaching our work in, in various settings that we think, first of all, about participation. You know, do we need to be thinking about participation in relation to absolutely everything that we're doing? Um, because I can just say it's come up yeah. with you and social work students and what's the name who are about. Um, as I said to you earlier, I had that experience myself where going straight into child care social work from university, yeah. dealing with um, initial assessments right through the adoption, yeah. whereas our students come out now, go into the likes of the Media Gateway team or family intervention or the doctor team, and they're kind of, do we get into face that? one element or one aspect of, of working with families mm -hmm. and if you look at how many levels a family and how many people they've come involved with from initial assessment right through you know we could have maybe three social workers within a couple of months and you know these are participation and all of that you know can be quite challenging plus you're having a high burnout in front of our staff. I know a lot of our students um most of the qualified come in struggle to get Permanent employment, so I mean, financially, mm -hmm. the need is there for the social mm -hmm. worker, and then what is the financial money box that's available to, to keep the staff or to actually employ them? It's a challenge, and then motivation, you know, you've all of those elements. But interestingly, with the social work strategy going forward, I mean, I get a sense that there's a, a recognition of the importance of supervision. Mm -hmm. And supervision is going to be very much part of the future going forward. It certainly was the way it was for me when I was a senior and when I was a social worker. I mean, these areas around participation and citizenship and engagement are all topics that hopefully will be able to come up in supervisions. And if a social worker feels that they're not getting enough time to actually do relationship-based work, well then, I mean, this notion of being politically active and committed to social justice, I mean, there's, there's a platform there through supervision to say, well, look, you know, we need to have our voice heard here in terms of you know, what is it we're doing. And, and that was the, the point that Monroe made. Uh, following the, the baby Peter Connolly case, you know, that social workers need more time to be on the front line, to be engaged with families, to be engaged with children, to be engaged in relationships. I know that within the social work strategy and the innovation fund, you know, one of the specific um, targets for this round, for this year, is um, development, ser meaningful service user involvement at all levels of social work provision. So it'll be interesting to see the kind of projects emanating from that and see if it kind of begins to shift practice yeah. um, and that those good mm. experiences are then kind of mainstreamed out across practice. It'll be interesting to I mean I do get that. a sense that people are positively embracing this as well, mm -hmm. knowing that it's not all a challenge and that uh, we are starting to see evidence of uh, that people are, colleagues are realising that you know, there are benefits and that it's a uh, you know, addressing experiential knowledge in this way and addressing user involvement in this way can <coughs> result in positive benefits in terms I mean, of the service overall. I think the strategy also gives the opportunity to, to try and um, get some quick wins in the system around bureaucracy and workload management and those sort of things that yeah. you can kind of hold people back. Um, so the debate around that or how that happens out there in teams and some, some of the work is being piloted, and I think, I think it's probably very valuable work mm -hmm. um, because how can you start to get into more complex, uh, meaningful relationships and work with, with, with the clients if you're feeling as a worker completely um, you know, bombarded with bureaucracy and uh, under pressure because people are leaving and not being replaced. So those sort of practical things need to be addressed. Uh, and there's always going to be the requirements, I think, in terms of you know, clear joint you know, child protection arrangements, um, joint protocol mm -hmm. processes that will always need to be in place. Um, but that needs to be, uh, I suppose, attached to the innovative and the creative and around, around the bigger social outcomes society wants from, from social work and from, from services. Yeah. So it's a huge challenge right there. Um, Any other comments? Um, Mr.
So, do you want to see a little bit of this? Mm -hmm. um, it's sh short DVD. It's available for students. It's free. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, been used now for teaching in America and, and parts of Europe and other parts of the world, thankfully. So, um, it took about it took about a year to make. It lasts no longer than twenty minutes. Um, it was a real challenge in terms of trying to get it edited down. We actually didn't meet each other until the film was made and produced when we launched it in Istanbul uh, just the year before last. Um, anybody play music in here? Anybody play the guitar? Um, you'll notice the guitar music in the background that was uh, written by my youngest son. Um, so I'm really pleased as well that uh, there's a personal side to this. Um, and I should say as well, but uh, without the family, I'd be nowhere in terms of getting all this work done. They've been such a support to me over the years. And so it's nice that um, the oldest son's in here as well in terms of the background music for this. It certainly makes it all the more special for me. So I'll let this play. It, speak, it really does speak for itself, but it, it involves those questions that were asked. You know, whenever we, we sent our students out here in Northern Ireland, the service user groups in Dungannon, Armagh, uh, Belfast, uh, and up in Antrim, right across Northern Ireland. Um, and they all went out with about five or six questions. Um, in term, and those questions were linked to how they should treat, how service users wanted to be treated by students or by newly qualified social workers. And we used exactly the same questions in Spain, in Alicante, and in Ljubljana, which is in Slovenia. The questions are presented in three languages. Okay, and you'll see those popping up. And then the answers to the questions come up in English, Spanish and Slovenian uh, in subtitles at the bottom. So I do hope you can see it, but if you can't, maybe come up a wee bit closer. Um, that's why I darkened the whole room out, so as you could, this would come across quite clearly. Okay, so as I say, it is quite short, but it, I think it's quite interesting in terms of its key, key messages. My name is Joe Duffy. I'm a lecturer in social work at Queen's University of Belfast, Northern Ireland. In this film, which is supported by funding from the International Association of Students of Social Work, you will hear from the service users and carers from Spain, Slovenia, and Northern Ireland, who will share their views with social work students about important aspects of social work knowledge, skills, and values. The film is translated using the subtitles in English, and two further versions of the film are available in both Slovenian and Spanish. We believe that the key messages in this film will contribute significantly to advancing our understanding of service user and care involvement in an international context. I would like to thank the service users and carers from Spain, Slovenia and Northern Ireland for giving us their time, commitment and hard work in making this film a reality. I would also like to thank our colleagues here in Queen's University of Belfast, our colleagues in the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and in the University of Alicante, Spain, for helping us and supporting us in making this film possible.
koji će provoda je pa nekaj socijalna nečuta, tako da bomo v tem smislu pomagali. I think uh, social workers should be non-judgmental in their attitude towards people. I think they should treat people as people first and not cases. You have to be personal. You have to explain to people why you're there, but you have to do it in a nice, friendly manner, warm, so that you can give them that understanding that they need. Las actitudes y la cualidad de una terapeuta social, pues, la sinceridad, la serenidad, la paciencia, la calma, transmitirte confianza, que tú puedas sentir que puedes llegar a ella, el sentirte pues en confianza. Social worker best show you respect when they're working with you? My expectations of a social worker are that they understand that while it may be a case to them, it's my life. <laughs> a su despacho y no atenderte en un pasillo o atenderte por teléfono como me ha pasado a mí. and have a good rest of the day. And spare their time with me. I've been there for half an hour with me. Spend it with me. Don't us. No way to go off or have to reverse to do another job. That half hour is fine. And I could change my life. I would like it to be discussed directly with myself and I would also like to try and 
be able to have an input, but for it to be taken seriously or for the social worker to try their best to accommodate your wishes as much as they are allowed to. Pues aparte de lo que la trabajadora social me está indicando, también me gustaría que me hiciera partícipe de, de lo que se está tratando. Y así, participando ella y participando yo, nos entenderíamos mucho mejor. What are the things that matter most to you when a social worker visits you and makes contact with you? I would like them to be uh, friendly when they come into the house. I would, wouldn't like them to come into my home and start to uh, give orders uh, you know, to do this, to do that, to, to turn the TV. It's actually my home they're coming into, so it is. So, uh, be very, be, have a friendly attitude. Pues ahí es cuando se refleja la calidad de profesional que tiene, puesto que entra y vale un, un espacio, el hábitat y la intimidad de, de, una, de una persona que tiene que transmitirle confianza y, y que se sienta a gusto que puede la persona a, de que necesita ese servicio eh, confía en ella. That they remember that they, if they're coming into your house, that it is your house and um, that they are comfortable talking, as comfortable talking to me um, and to put me at the ease. I think that's the, the most important thing. La parte humana de, de la trabajadora o trabajador social es muy importante, la parte humana, la parte solidaria, eh, que sepa realmente eh, no, no ya lo, lo que uno pide, sino lo que uno necesita. their facial expressions and their body language and their use of hands to, to understand, so the, to acknowledge that what I have already said to them, that they can understand it exactly the same way. Pues a la hora de hablar contigo, que te mira a los ojos y te escuche todo lo que estás diciendo, la experiencia que he tenido con las trabajadoras sociales ha sido totalmente indiferente. Yo he tenido que llegar a su consulta y y no me han solucionado, no me han aconsejado, no me han asesorado, no, no me han dicho lo que tenía que hacer. I think I would know social workers really listening to me if they were able to feed back to me um, what it is that I'm saying to them, if they were showing some clear understanding of the issues and if they were looking at the context of my life and could understand that perhaps what I'm asking for is um, needed immediately. Well, I'm going to go to the middle of porque si aparte la vista quiere decir que no pasa del día olímpicamente.
want to know how they can tell when a social worker is trying to understand how they are feeling. When I heard that um, she wants to say through their body language and whenever they share maybe bits and pieces of their own life without being too personal because obviously they're super professional boundary but it's nice to have a bit of a two-way thing. También como comentábamos, eh, cuando tú le vas planteando las vivencias que estás teniendo con, con tu hijo, que te mira, que tienes una, sientes una situación de empatía, eh, un tono cordial. By showing empathy and that with me and they, that they understand what I'm saying um, by the fact that they can repeat it back to me. Lo primero que te siente y te mira la cara y te mire como persona, no te mire como un ser que ya no, no vale para nada, que está haciendo las cosas de rutina. Desde tu punto de vista, ¿qué cosas debería saber una trabajadora social sobre ti cuando está intentando ayudar? Conocer tu caso, plenamente, en todos los aspectos. Las necesidades, las dificultades, en lo que puedes ir más, más ágil en lo que no y poder ayudarte de, de alguna manera. No te soporto, Dios, que miedo, que miedo, que skupinami, tako imenovanimi, bi mogli bi tudi pač prvično angažirane v tej smeri. Zato ne samo pač nekaj podaljšnja je v prodržave, kot je to zdaj se bistvo zelo kažno v Sloveniji, ampak bi mogli bi v prvi vrsti pri oblikovanju socialnih politik in odpršovanju, v bistvu pokoju, ki generirajo nejenakosti. Tako da mislim, da ta vloga emancipacije, tudi poličnega aktivizma v širšem smislu je v bistvu, če se zelo. The interview should be based on your knowledge, their history. You should know that before you enter. La maxima informacion posible, tanto de mi como de mi problema y los recursos que existen para solucionar ese problema. Tu pregunta es que se debe ser más de que no pasa el street. Not that they should be influenced by what happened in the past, but they should have knowledge of the issues that they're coming to discuss with me and a basic work of knowledge, because in that situation, I see myself as the expert. Yo cuando muchas veces voy a a un trabajador social, yo parto de una cosa que si yo soy cuidadora, mejor que yo conozca en este caso a mi hijo, no lo conoce nadie. Me da igual que sea un psicólogo o un trabajador social. Porque no tienes experiencia en ese sentido, tú no puedes eh, evaluar a una persona en cinco minutos o en una hora. Es muy importante que se conozca la historia que se lleva entre manos.
that's the film that hopefully brings a lot of that stuff all together. Um,